Good, good morning. Thanks for having me this morning. Um, I, my, uh, my title uh, was billed as Trends in Insurance Global Ecosystems. Uh, I decided to change it a little bit uh, because we all want to be winners here. Uh, so I'm calling it winners in the new insurance ecosystems, and I would say new digital insurance ecosystems. Um, ecosystems have been around for a while, so why are they so important? Um, so I'll spend, so for today, we'll talk about really what's driving uh, global disruption. We'll talk about how it's affecting the insurance business, and we'll talk about ecosystems and how they're changing. Ecosystems have been around for a while. They're just different now that we have digital capabilities. And so that has an impact on how insurance companies compete and how, the customer, and how they serve customers differently. And then I have a, a case example around a digital greenfield insurer we're building in the Caribbean. Um, it's in, and it's a response to uh, the parent company and how they want to compete going forward in a completely digital platform. And it will talk you, talk you through why they chose a greenfield option versus trying to adjust their legacy systems. Uh, just one page here on who is Oliver Wyman. Um, we're a uh, global insurance, uh, global consulting firm. Uh, about half of our revenues, uh, we have about two billion in revenue, Half of that is serving financial services companies, maybe 50% banks, 50% insurers. Uh, we also have uh, an energy and aviation practice. Um, but in terms of our insurance practice, you know, we serve most of the global uh, top 50 insurers. Uh, most of our time is spent lately on digital transformation, uh, new customer value propositions, and helping companies compete in the, the new digital environment. Um, but we also have uh, capabilities in core, you know, core uh, insurance um, um, processes such as claims and underwriting and asset management. So let's talk a little bit about setting the stage around, you know, ecosystems and how they're changing. So we've had, we've talked, you know, other speakers have spoken about, um, you know, what's really, what are the big three trends going on? You know, the societal trends are really, are really driving changes in what customers need, okay? So I think when we think about ecosystems, it's about, it's about the customer and their needs. So those needs are changing and the expectations are changing because of the, you know, emergence of social media and the interconnectedness of our lives with you know, uh, various, various players in, in the ecosystems and the way customers' uh, expectations are changing to be much more instant on demand. And I think a reinforcing theme around embedding protection into your daily activities, wh whether it be driving to the airport or, uh, you know, buying or renting a home or uh, uh, using an, a an Airbnb. Um, and also in the middle there, tech and data, you know, the rapid advance of technology is really driving the way ecosystems are changing and the way insurance companies need to interact with customers. So if you look at, you know, back in 2004, um, yeah, the technology was, was server-based, right? I mean, I mean, insurance companies still own servers, right? But none of the insure techs started in the last year or two own anything other than laptops. Everything's in the cloud. So, you know, with interactions around social media and social networks and the sharing economy, um, the way people interact with providers is very much digital and mobile now. And in the last few years, you're seeing, you know, much, uh, ver very rapid adoption of consumers uh, banking and insurance and almost anything else through their phone or through browser-based systems. Uh, the, the, the age of the intermediary, it, uh, the nature of the intermediary is changing. And you're seeing uh, insurance and protection and, and other banking services embedded into the customer experience. So I'll be talking a lot about the customer experience and how that needs to change and how insurance companies need to really rethink 
the way they offer protection. And if you look outside of the insurance business, um, the three, three examples here, the retail, in, uh, retail industry, the hospitality industry, the banking industry, um, it's been amazing to see uh, how value is migrated and what's, what's driving that. The way customers uh, expect to be served is, is changing in the retail space. I mean, well, this is a change in market cap between 2007 and 2018, about a 10-year period. You know, Walmart didn't do, didn't, too, didn't do too badly, right? $141 billion up to $280 billion in market cap. Um, but Amazon, okay, went from almost nowhere to three times uh, uh, Walmart's market cap. Why? Because customers value convenience. They, can, they value the personalization you get in the Amazon experience. And, I mean, they have, and if you look at what you can buy at a Walmart versus what you can buy at Amazon, you know, the SKUs are at a huge multiple, a lot more comprehensive set of offerings. Hospitality, I mean, Mar Marriott, for example, is about a $45 billion market cap company, um, but Airbnb, in almost no time, has almost matched them in terms of their market cap, and Marriott recently announced sort of a new business, which is going into the uh, sharing economy and home sharing uh, 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 space. So customers are looking at uh, being wanted to be served better around, you know, much more choice, uh, more flexibility, uh, and a much more interactive experience. Banking, similarly, um, you know, the millennials uh, really prefer to do things, uh, do, do payments on their phones. Uh, it, it's completely different. Than, than it would be. They don't really don't think about the branch network uh, or, or um, their checking accounts. They don't even think about checking accounts. They think about transferring money you know, between, uh, between each other using the PayPal app. And so just a quick snapshot of uh, some of the, bank, so the, you know, the uh, banks and insurers you know, being outperformed by these upstarts. Uh, the, the upstarts, the fintech firms, are uh, increasing their uh, market cap over this five-year period by 169%, whereas, you know, the traditional banks and insurers, they're having growth, but there's a lot of value migrating to the new platforms. And then what does it mean for the insurance space? I mean, you're seeing a lot of value being added by non-insurance companies, right? Um, and if you look at uh, the profitability of these companies and the growth of these companies versus a traditional insurance company, it's, it's, it's pretty staggering. And, they're, uh, and they are uh, working across the value chain. You know, in, in uh, product and distribution, um, they're creating new platforms that are much more customer-centric. In most cases, really not serving the traditional agency networks. Uh, creating much more active ways of engaging with customers on a continuous basis. Uh, and then in both in commercial insurance and uh, uh, um, personal insurance. In underwriting and pricing, you know, it's all about having the right information available to you to make a decision. I mean, Ernie talked about, you know, the right information at the right time to arrive at the right price. Um, there are a lot of ways to get that, extract that data. You know, agree. In certain markets, some of that data is tougher to get, but the trend overall is for uh, underwriting and pricing decisions made on new sources of information and dynamic pricing. You know, in customer service, actually there's a much longer list of companies here uh, that are providing uh, in ways to interact with your customer uh, using machine learning, uh, being, being able to predict the next best action, um, and become much more friendly to consumers you know, in sort of digital platforms. And in claims, we'll hear later today from Snapsheet uh, as one example, but uh, the claims customer experience is undergoing dramatic improvements. Uh, in some cases, the companies are building those new capabilities to you know, do first notice of loss, streamline the, uh, the, for example, in auto claims, streamline the, the, the process of getting your car to an auto body shop and you know, providing the rental uh, you know, online in real, real time. Um, but but uh, 
the, the double whammy is, I don't know if that translates well into Spanish, but the, double, the impact is that it, the, things, the experience is getting better and uh, the efficiency is getting better and the accuracy of the claims payment is getting better. So um, I'm not sure we've spent a lot of time talking about you know, or defining an ecosystem. And, and what does an ecosystem mean to me? Um, first of all, the consumer is at the middle of the ecosystem. And I've heard, I've heard some people say, we're building an ecosystem. Um, I'm not sure how you do that. <coughs> Excuse me. The ecosystems are already there. Uh, and it's up to us to figure out how to connect the dots between the consumer and various, and various uh, providers of services. So an ecosystem is interconnected, a family of relevant services. Think about mobility services or hospitality services with a consumer at the middle. Um, an ecosystem should reduce friction across products and services, and it, it should actually add value by integrating data. And it is all about the data, and insurance companies need to think about how they're going to organize an architect to you know, get better at gathering data, analyzing data from various, uh, both internal and third-party sources. And participating in an ecosystem re requires you to, um, I guess, have a mentality around, you know, entering into partnerships, dynamic partnerships, active partnerships, whereby there's a win-win-win uh, because one-sided partnerships don't last very long. So consumers benefit by having you know, uh, greater value, and ecosystem participants uh, particip uh, benefit by having lower customer acquisition costs and greater access to, you know, data, which is going to be driving consumer demand. Um, this is a super simple, actually the, the message is simple, but the, the chart is complex, um, but sort of how do, how do you think about driving revenue from uh, an ecosystem? I mean, clearly you could be, uh, deriving revenue from referring third parties to, into your network. Um, you could integrate a third party offering into your offering. Uh, for example, we saw recently an insurance company in the US purchased, actually purchased, a company that repairs cell phones. So they're, they're embedding you know, cell phone repair into you know, a homeowner's or, or a renter's policy. Um, or you can monetize third party, uh, any data you're creating by selling it to third parties. In the US, a company called Allstate has created Arity, which is a separate division, which is all about telematics data around driving patterns. And they're trying to create a, a, a telematics-based risk score. Now, not all companies have enough data to be able to monetize it, but that's one, one, one current example. And, and another point is that, you know, non-insurance companies are embedding insurance and protection. I think we talked a little bit about this already, especially the, the Uber working with multiple insurers on usage-based insurance. In fact, this morning I saw the press release where Insure, uh, which is actually funded by, partially funded by Munich Re, struck a deal with Uber, and so that, which is a basically uh, digital first, uh, uh, protection platform for Uber drivers. It includes not only, you know, the auto insurance for when there's not a passenger there, but it, it, it adds, it converts it to a sort of a commercial policy um, when, the, when the passenger's in, in, and it also sells health and other benefits. It will also ultimately sell health and other benefits to the, to the Uber drivers. So this is a comprehensive view of, of what, in this case, the Uber driver at the center. Uh, of the of the uh, of the offering of the of the of the of the ecosystem. I mean, Amazon is going to be in the insurance business in some in some capacity. Uh, it may not be n tomorrow, but they are experimenting. They've gone in and out here and there, um, but they have the ability right now. Uh, they're offering in the UK, um, sort of you know more of a warranty product as it relates to uh, something you buy on the platform. Uh, but that will, that will I, I would guess, what, in five years, that will, that will uh, uh, mature into a much more uh, fully developed offering. And then, um, this is a good example of Zong An. I, I don't, there are a couple of uh, uh, points on Zong An yesterday, but I think the key point of this is they think about ecosystems as it relates to the consumer and the consumer need. So, in, if you, in the sports uh, ecosystem, well, 
it's sort of the active, young uh, sports enthusiast is sort of that, is at the center of that ecosystem. And they're offering, it by, by virtue of some of their wearable devices, you know, the ability to monitor, uh, you know, how active you are. And that can, in turn, um, switch on and off uh, insurance for if you go rock climbing, you know, they'll switch on, you can switch on a coverage that day for, you know, your injury protection. So you need more when you're rock climbing than you do when you're walking down the street, typically, for example. Um, it's been very successful. Um, ride platforms, they have a similar embedded insurance into the, uh, their, their Uber equivalent is Didi, uh, but they have a, a similar uh, offering whereby uh, for drivers, they're not just selling the auto insurance, they're selling a small, uh, at, at, at completion of every ride, uh, you get a small premium deducted, which is providing you for your health insurance. Now, typically, a self-insured gig economy, sorry, a, a gig economy person is not going to have, you know, health benefits. So they're providing, you know, a value, valued service there. Uh, this is sort of the, <laughs> this is a, a, a page. We, were, we worked on this uh, for a U.S. Uh, insurance company about a year ago where they were trying to figure out, you know, what is the offer for uh, 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 fleets, uh, commercial fleets. And uh, some of the capabilities are, are sort of manufactured in-house. Others are leveraged from uh, ecosystem providers. So lots of different variations on, you know, who is the market, who is the customer. But designing the, the, the offering around the customer is key, and then being able to construct the construct the offer based on based on sourcing it from third parties is is key as well. So you know, is your is your co company currently capable of partnering, ingesting data, uh, dynamically pricing, and responding to you know changing customer needs? So, so what are some of the challenges that? you know, insurance companies are facing as they try to become digital ready. Uh, I think this is all about understanding how you want to play in selected ecosystems and becoming digitally ready to, to, to become a leader. I mean, some of the big barriers are, you know, legacy, right? I mean, I, most in le legacy insurance companies are spending a huge chunk of their IT budget, upwards of 80%, and what I call keeping the lights on, right? Making sure your uh, security patches are up to date, um, uh, maintaining old systems that uh, only a few people know how to program. Uh, so those are highly complex systems which are difficult to convert over. Um, also, I mean, in, in sort of this digital first economy, the customer uh, is at the forefront, not necessarily the agent. And a lot of our technology has been built around serving an agency platform or, or a broker platform and, you know, under-invested in the front-end customer experience. Then there's lots of complexity in the life world around, you know, uh, calculating asset values and the different policy generations, some of which are 30 and 40 years old, still need to be maintained. So that's actually sucking a lot of resources out of your, uh, your ability to innovate. Not, not great news, but, <laughs> but um, there are ways around it, which we'll get to. Um, so we've seen companies do like one of four uh, ways of uh, participating uh, in the insure tech world, um, investing directly um, with, potentially the in with the potential to ultimately have become one of those investors, a, a partner or a value-added service to, to um, you know, the, the, the uh, parent company, um, partnering, you know, plugging in the insure tech capability into, into an existing business model to solve a specific problem. Uh, arguably, I'm not sure that really gets you where you need to go. Um, acquiring a company, I mean, uh, that's probably going to happen more going, going forward. But the examples in the U.S. are Allstate buying insurance, which was a slide. Uh, the Slice folks had a similar slide here. But, you know, with the minimum viable product approach, you're not trying to solve for every customer need, you know, on day one. What you're trying to do is uh, get into the market, get consumers to start testing, to, you know, experience your product. So you improve this experience over time, you improve the functionality over time, 
uh, you're continuously harvesting data you're learning from transactions and interactions with customers, and then begin to scale it up. And then ultimately, the objective here is to build a new digital business. Uh, what's the time frame here? Two, two points on this slide. One, not every MVP is going to scale to digital business, OK? The point is, you're going to have some failures, but you'll have relatively low-cost failures and low-risk failures. Um, but the, the ones that do mature can become a new digital business for you. And the other part, I think that's the key point. Um, you know, in terms of what you should be aiming for, um, sort of four key things, clearly the technical capabilities, you know, um, having the ability to dynamically price, having the ability to ingest data, having the ability to, you know, learn from customer experience, you know, start adding behavioral economics type lessons learned in, into your customer experience uh, and being sort of flexible in the cloud from the technical capability. Uh, you know, operating model, operating model is different. Uh, you have to have multiple, at least have to. I would argue you need to have the ability to experiment with multi multiple go-to-market strategies. Um, and then ecosystem access, you know, built so that you can ingest data. And then new ways of working, you know, much leaner organizations, faster decision cycles, a more agile type uh, 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 way of working. So I'll spend some time here on a real-life case study. It's occurring now. I'm missing right now the Steerco meeting. Um, but uh, we uh, helped an insurance company uh, create a, a new co, a new co. It's, it's in the Caribbean. I can't really tell you too much about it because it's going live in August. But uh, the idea was this is a mid-sized company. Okay? It doesn't have all the resources in the world. And they had tried digital transformation a couple of times and really weren't getting anywhere and decided, uh, we helped them decide that um, having a new co with d digital at the core, um, built, from, built from scratch, uh, with super simple products initially, focused on a market that uh, was com very underserved in this, in this, in this um, country uh, uh, at, a, at a very low price point. We also set it up uh, almost as a, uh, well, as a venture-funded uh, company. So every 90 days, there is a venture board. And the venture board consists of management team from uh, the parent company, as well as outside advisors who've actually built digital businesses. And every 90 days, milestones are reached uh, or not, and the funding for the next 90 days occurs. Now, we have a fairly clear view as to what it will take over a three-year period to build this. But the fact is, the, the, the bank account for the new co gets funded every 90 days. It's going down to zero, you know, end of June, and then in July, it'll, it'll get funded again. So uh, it's a very much entrepreneurial mindset uh, and uh, fast decision making. And as I said, and I'll show you, we're getting into the market pretty quickly. So Q3 of last year, we spent a lot of time helping them build the, the, the business case. So you know, who, who's, who's the customer? How will you interact with that customer? What are the unmet needs for that customer? And I'll give you a, a little bit of a hint. One, one customer segment we're looking at is folks who are sending their kids to private school, uh, low, low middle income folks who are sending their kids to private school. So there's essentially an e education ecosystem, right, around parents, principals, uh, teachers, students, and then, of course, the schools. So we're, we're crafting a go-to-market strategy which involves touch, those, those touch points with a value prop that says your education, will your education will be funded through graduation. So it's a combination of a disability and life product that serves the need to graduate my child. Um, so that was sort of one, one of the uh, value props. So we helped build a, uh, we cr crafted the architecture for this, built the business case for it, you know, came up with three initial MVPs for, for go-to-market, knowing that one probably won't work, <laughs> and then uh, a couple will, will, will get traction. Uh, and then we help them set up the, the mobilization strategy and the go-to-market launch plan. So in January, um, we uh, received the funding to, you know, begin assembling the, the, the components, uh, built out the technology roadmap and mobilized 
the, the company. We're helping them now uh, uh, sort of uh, manage a number of subcontractors, uh, customer experience design uh, firms. We've actually uh, been instrumental in getting them hire, hiring on the new management team. And uh, we're ready to launch, uh, fingers crossed, in late August. So we started in January. We're going to launch MVPs in August in the market, fully licensed products. Um, it's going to be kind of fun. So what do, what do we, in terms of the operating model, you know, kind of a different approach to, you know, uh, building a business unit within a company. Um, in terms of the entity, it's a completely new company uh, with its own license. Um, branding is a little bit, a little bit, a little bit tricky. We want to be a digital brand, but we also want to convey that we're stable. So there's sort of a mixed, mixed branding between, you know, this company's sort of new and innovative, but it's from another institution you trust in this country. In this country. The organization model is completely different, very flat. Um, you know, we're making decisions on a sort of week, weekly basis that would typically at, at the parent company take, you know, months or years. Uh, the governance model I mentioned before, the, the, uh, the venture board, and then the, uh, the funding, as I mentioned, it's stage gated. So we're limiting our risk. Um, and we're only, f and we're actually course correcting and, and sending funds to, you know, different, uh, different uh, uses based on what we're learning as we go along. So the architecture, you know, I said sort of three levels to it. Um, you know, the customer interaction level, the systems interaction, uh, which are all web and mobile uh, uh, facing, web and mobile uh, deployed, but also using chat and chat bots, and also having uh, this data ingestion uh, through into, from the ecosystems is key as part of our design. Because um, we know we can't do this without partners. And this, you know, for, for example, in the, uh, the education space, we're going to be able to uh, pull data from the schools themselves. Uh, and then so we, so we have a core system here, you know, the core insurance uh, policy system. Then off of that hang, you know, a payment system, an analytics CRM system, and we have both the core data out of the uh, policy system, if you will, and then this data lake, which, which includes lots of unstructured data. And so, you know, and one of our, I think our second hire is a data scientist uh, to, to come and help us sort of manage the, you know, the customer record. The, the, the most fun part of this, of this startup is that we get, to, we get to design the customer record from scratch Okay, we don't have to deal with trying to, you know, uh, merge data between different data silos. So we're getting, hopefully, we're getting the data right the first time. I'll skip through this, but um, I will say, in terms of the um, the cost, the entry cost, okay, I'll say is well under five million dollars to build this company. Uh, a lot less than five million dollars. The, the initial licensing. Uh, for the software is all on a, on a variable cost basis. So we start out low with no premium, and as we grow, the vendors participate in, 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 the, in the volume. And then in terms of our methodology, we're using a combination of I guess, agile and waterfall, right? Um, we can't go completely uh, at this stage. The company is not mature enough, quite frankly, uh, as a new co to go agile from day one. Um, and the way some of the, some of the vendors still operate is in a kind of a waterfall framework, but we're combining it into sprints. And this is actually uh, a methodology we're sticking much more closely to in a couple of other projects outside of the one I'm speaking of. But it, it, it's all defined around 90-day sprints, okay? And these, in these 90-day sprints, we define exactly what we're going to deliver, uh, or at least we have targets of what we're going to deliver. And then every two weeks, there is sort of an incremental uh, check-in as to whether we're making, making, meeting those objectives. And then, you know, at the monthly review, um, we decide whether we're there or not, and then, then modify and adjust the end product. So um, you don't always get exactly where you're aiming for in the 98 because you're learning all the way, but the, the key is being flexible in the, in the build and, and having sort of a clear set of objectives you're going to comp compete against every 90 days. So there, there is sort of a high-level two, three-year roadmap, but frankly, the next 90 days is what we're really focused on because we know we'll get there ultimately if we get really focused on, in this case, building you know, an insurance, insurance company in three 90-day sprints, essentially. A little less than three 90-day sprints. 
And so, again, a lot of the, this, these are the factors that really weren't, did not factor into the business case, but the, the parent company gets, is getting a lot of benefit from having this new co. Um, new customer, they're reaching new customers they would not have met, they would not have reached otherwise. So they have, you know, the flexibility to, in fact, they sprung one on us last week, we want to add another product. Well, typically, you kind of freak out if you're building a company and they want to add a new product. But actually, we modified the work plan uh, last week and we're going to add another product <laughs> uh, and uh, we can still make the timeline because we have this rules-based product configura configuration engine which allows us to reuse lots of different components that we, we already had built for, for the other three initial, initially planned products. So the speed at which we can uh, innovate uh, and respond to customer demand is just not, is not available in their legacy systems. So now they're going to be ultimately using this architecture you know, in three to five years to, uh, to, to uh, uh, enable the, the, the parent company. They'll be ultimately taking some of their uh, sort of uh, low, low premium, uh, simple products and converting them over to the new digital platform, you know, at policy renewal over time, which will take their costs way down and improve their flexibility and customer experience. So again, um, the IT cost structure, uh, they're ultimately going to be, this is really the future state uh, architecture is the new co. And uh, it's, it's flexible so enough in the API world, whereby our initial CRM solution is only designed for the first couple of years because, because we don't really know what, what, the, what the three to five year needs are going to be in CRM. Uh, the beauty of it is we are confident we can swap out that CRM system for another CRM system you know, using, the, using the API architecture um, and having rigorous uh, data governance down in the, uh, in the data lake and in the customer, um, customer data center. So lots of new tools. And this will, this will enable this company to expand across the Caribbean. They have ultimately, ultimate goals to move into Latin America, but they want to prove the concept out. But it'll be relatively simple for them to turn this on in at country X, uh, Latin-speaking country X, fairly soon, probably within the next couple of years. So um, I'm almost finished, but just in terms of getting back to the point around ecosystems, because that was, was the topic, I, the key is to think about it in terms of customer needs. So it's, it's the customer need around, I need, to, I need to get from point A to point B, mobility. It's the customer, customer need around wanting to secure my child's education. Um, when we did focus groups, we didn't use the word insurance at all. Uh, we, we asked them about security. We asked them about what keeps them awake at night. And uh, so we started out with sort of focus group research but ultimately, our learning is going to, uh, around how customers are behaving, is going to modify the value proposition over time. Um, I think also setting up a partnership culture. Um, you know, in the old school you know, insurance companies I've worked with, uh, sometimes it's about, we're the insurance company, we have a lot of value to add, and we're gonna extract value from our partner. It's really about setting something up where both the partner and the insurance company ultimately win, serve the customer better, and find new ways to partner in different ways as the partnership evolves. So having a, you know, a five-year partnership agreement really isn't the way uh, things work at, at this stage. So thinking about partnerships in a different way. You know, data at the core. I mean, this company was built, the new co, is, is built on the fact that you know, we get a chance now to ingest customer data, ingest third-party data, and create new value propositions. And um, we're going to be continuously learning around that. Our first, as I mentioned, our first or second hire was a data scientist, even before we hired the GM. And then, you know, get some things going. I would start somewhere. Uh, and I, I, I know I've talked about Greenfield here, but I think the Greenfield type approach, you don't necessarily need to create a Greenfield company. You can create a greenfield customer service capability, a greenfield claims capability, and then ultimately, you know, you may end up with a uh, with a full greenfield or a new co type uh, capability. 
But I think the, the key is to get started. And uh, with that in mind, I think I'm finished and have a couple minutes for questions. We also have, uh, there's a one page sort of handout uh, before the, uh, as you leave that uh, illustrates a little bit around building the business case for a greenfield capability. Any questions from the audience? Okay, thanks.